listeners, welcome to Flanagan's Ecologic Podcast and our special series, The Clean Energy Crash Course, a father-daughter duo. I'm your co-host, Sierra Flanagan, joined by my father, Ted Flanagan, and we're excited. We have an exciting topic today that we're going to dive into, um, which is actually quite personal and also something that I think aspirational for, for all of us. Um, as we talk about some of the sustainability leadership that's gone on there um, with renewables. So dad, welcome. It's, well, thanks. It's just, we're back from a big wedding weekend at Millbrook. At Millbrook School in New York, about a couple hours north of New York City, what 175 of us gathered to celebrate daughter Sky's wedding. Yeah, pretty epic really. Um, and the same, chapel that my grandmother got married in um my grandmother your mother 93 years old attended the wedding looking smashing <laughs> and um yeah so it was pretty pretty significant but i so i've had my i spent my senior year at millbrook school in millbrook new york my sister spent her junior and senior year there as i mentioned in my speech service the school is built on this notion this commitment to service um, and community service the 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 crest of the logo reads non sibi sed cunctus not for one but for all so let's you know okay so the the very beginning of the story is 1931 when your grandparents actually founded the school <laughs> yeah, but yeah. um we can we can jump forward a little bit unless you want to provide any context on that no, I think that's great. It's it's uh, you guys. You know, we're in high school in Laguna Beach, happily in high school, and said, "Hey, we want to go to a fat." You know, making making a short story here, but you wanted to go check out this prep school that you know my grandparents, your great grandparents, founded. And I thought you're crazy. Why would you want to do that? Uh, so all the way across the country, you're happy in Laguna Beach, and you end up having just this incredible, incredible prep school prep school experience. Uh, and and because you guys were there. I got to know quite well the head of the environmental program there, Jane Meggs, uh, who really wanted to solarize the school. Mm -hmm. And so we kind of put our heads together and uh, she realized that having the grandson of the founder working on this project would have a little bit of cachet with the board and, and with all the naysayers that we encountered. There weren't too many naysayers, but but we were able to pull off, just I think, just an incredible solar project there. So we're, we're proud of it because it's the family school and then we, we've helped decarbonize it and we hope we can help a little bit more decarbonize it in the future and so as some listeners know i've embarked in the field of campus sustainability as my profession and so kind of witnessing millbrook's evolution and commitment towards sustainability has always been really inspiring to me um and so all these schools you know are appointing sustainability coordinators and you know getting their recycling and composting systems in place. And many of many of whom are pursuing decarbonization strategies. So what was the first step? I mean, there was some commitment in place, right? Can you set the, set the tone for us? You know, I think, I think Millbrook was part and parcel of that green schools Alliance. Thanks mm -hmm. to, again, thanks to Jane Meg, but you know, I, I just really credit Jane and, and some of the young students like yourselves that, that wanted to wanted Millbrook to be a leader, and you know she really had a lot of resistance. This was not one of the school's priorities, uh, but then then Berkshire School put in a solar system, and that got everybody's attention. That was actually founded, I think, by the Kellogg Foundation uh, and and uh, and a different mm -hmm. financial model. So, but the first thing that we did when we got engaged was to try to figure out, you know, what is the school's footprint? What's the carbon footprint? How much electricity would we need to generate on campus? And that took us down several paths. I mean, as you know, the first step in sizing any solar system or any renewable system is to figure out, you know, can you can you maximize your efficiency first? Can you can you reduce your load? And you know, Brother Russell and company, we looked at audited 46 buildings on campus, found all sorts of inefficiency, hundreds of measures. And so we netted that out of this the sizing that we would require. At the same time, the school was was realizing that geothermal systems were working. The first geothermal system went in at the school, 100 and, 160 foot wells, 15 of them, and they were 
they were working heating and cooling that math and science building that you know. So, so we realized that there was going to be more geothermal heating on campus that would increase the load. So, so at the end of the day, we ended up putting in a about a 1.7 megawatt solar system that we figured would net out all the electricity use on an annual basis for the school. So how how did the school pay for it? Um, you mentioned this wasn't an existing priority in their strategic plan. How? Well, a bunch of really, you know, that was some of the coolest part of the project was the financial part, uh, because we realized that uh, the school at the the school was really paying a very low price for power. Uh, they were buying power from Central Hudson Gas and Electric for around 10 cents a kilowatt hour, which is about half of what we're paying in California. And we thought, oh, no, that's such a low price that it's going to be hard to finance a system that's going to cost less than that, right, mm -hmm. at the end of the day. So, you know, we routinely see power purchase agreements out here, 12, 13, 14 cents. So if you're paying more, you don't want to pay more for power, solar power, than you're paying for grid power. So we were concerned. And that's when Mark Hopkinson, uh, who was actually a graduate of Millbrook, I think in 1965, same class as our friend Bob Anthony and, um, and, and John O'Megs, Jane's husband. But, but Mark got involved and we, we were talking and Mark's been a consultant to EcoMotion and, and we developed this thing. He really came up with the model. I named it and uh, taken lots of credit for it unfairly called the Benefactor Investment Model, the BIM. And it's a really cool model. And actually, Millbrook's chief financial officer, Bob Connolly, really glommed onto it. It was exciting because what we were going to do was we were going to find a group of alumni and benefactors of the school, and we're going to offer the, them the opportunity to invest in a, an LLC and to build and own a solar system at Millbrook School. And then they would charge the school for its power for five or six or seven years, tax, tax, the tax recapture period. They monitor all the tax benefits. And at that point, they flip, but they, they've made all their money back with a small two or 3% return. And they flip the whole solar system as a donation to the school. And the school has free power then for the rest of the life of the solar system. It was a brilliant model. Uh, and it really, uh, it allowed, you know, benefactors that, Maybe you've been on the sidelines instead of donating money to the school. Now they could invest and have a, they get a small return, but get their money back, but really help to leverage a project like that. So that was a really cool thing. And we actually approached some benefactors and had some benefactors interested. But then something even better happened. Uh, I guess even better because it was more expeditious that our, we were able to get a $1.25 $1 million grant from NYSERDA, the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority through one of their program opportunity notices. And at the time, New York State was spending, it was at $109 million out there to support systems just like the kind of system that we were, what we were putting in. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, and I, I truly believe that Millbrook does not understand, the school does not understand, but probably most people don't understand what a good deal they got. But at the end of the day, Millbrook is paying seven and a half cents for, a kilo, for every kilowatt hour that comes off of that solar system for the next 20 years. Now the system is about nine years old at this point. So now central Hudson's prices have gone up. They're probably around 12 cents a kilowatt hour. So we're, we're, we're saving the school probably, you know, probably pushing 80 to a hundred thousand dollars per year, uh, through the power purchase agreement. The benefactor investment model would have, would have saved the school more like $8 million. And at the time they were trying to raise money for that, that Conus Berger hall, the new K, K hall, beautiful yeah. facility. And that cost $8 million. And we were saying, Hey, if you use the benefit factor investment model, it'll create that saving stream to pay for that dorm. But the school elected to go the other route, use the power purchase agreement originally with solar city, which is now Tesla and get the seven and a half cent deal for the next 20 years. So, so it was a, a pretty good story that this yeah. uh, here's a prep school that could just say, thanks to Jane Meggs, we want to go carbon. We want to be carbon neutral on our electricity. And, you know, fast forward and you got a deal where you're saving, you're not only putting no money down, but you're netting out your entire load and you're saving originally, it was about $50,000 a year. Well, and a lot of prep schools are engaging in these PPAs. And what I've seen and what I, we've spoken about previously is that many of them aren't savvy, savvy enough to realize that they're oftentimes losing their carbon credits. 
um, or the renewable energy credits. So can you speak to that, how you were able to retain those for Millbrook, even despite getting such a great deal? Well, that, yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because I every project we do, we, we, we retain the RECs or the carbon credits, the renewable energy certificates on behalf of the, on behalf of the client. And uh, yes, those, if you don't, uh, the developer, a solar developer obviously can take that, can take those and monetize those and allow others to pollute and to, and, and, and essentially strip away your own, bra if you care about bragging rights, essentially strip away your rights to say that you're green. And so, so Millbrook has gotten lots of, uh, I think, deserved credit for taking this step and, and, you know, greening its, greening its campus so dramatically. Uh, and we did so, and, and we retained the, the recs. And yes, I think you're right. There, you need to have somebody knowledgeable looking at these contracts uh, to make sure that, that you do retain the recs and, and that you've got good things like performance guarantees if the system fails and there's good O&M provisions that are built into it and buyout clauses and, and things like that. But Millbrook's deal, I think, is very solid. And, uh, you know, it's all they're buying measured kilowatt hours. Uh, if there's any shortfall, it's made up through the contract. That's that's incredible. Um, and so had they not pursued this solar system, they would be paying 12 cents per kilowatt hour. Right. I, I'm guessing somewhere in that ballpark. Yeah, still low compared to the national average, but uh, but right. yeah, it, it's, but it's seven and a half cents is pretty banger deal. Well, mm -hmm. it is a banger deal, and that's what you that's what you really want. You want to have a you want to you want a zero percent escalator, and then utility rates. We know utility rates will rise, and so into the future, you have greater and greater say a greater and greater saving stream. Now, I calculate through the PPA deal that we got. They'll probably, you know, in addition to having no money down and all that good stuff, they'll probably save about a million and a half, maybe $2 million. The BIM model, the benefactor investment model, really is a, would be a preferable route just from a financial standpoint, but it involves, it's more complex. It involves bringing together a group of benefactors and, right. um, yeah, and, 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 you know, the, the development office at Millbrook, uh, you know, you know, some of the players. They were like, oh, wait a second, are you going to be pirating, you know, money from our other campaigns right. to go to this yeah. one? And so there was, you know, there was that understandable tension there. So I think at the end of the day, end of the day, we did good. The school, the school's got pretty much exactly what it, what it wants. I, I wandered up to the solar site last week when we were there, a couple weeks ago when we were there. And early in the morning, I, it was sort of a misty morning. And I, I passed through that swamp on the way down from the gym to the solar field and there was a family of deer hanging out and then I went up to the solar system and the sun was coming up and the, you know, the panels were just that, that row after row and then undulating there where there's the granite outcropping. I was, I had a really good sense about what, what we did there and what we accomplished there and, and proud yeah. of all the people that made it happen. And if your great grandparents could see, you know, your, you, the namesake of your grandfather, Edward Pulling, um, came and decarbonized the campus. Um, <laughs> yeah, and I think did it pretty, big... pretty innovatively too. I mean, so there's that element, but then also, I mean, this model, BIM, benefit, Benefactor Investor Model, I know you've written a white paper about it and, um, you know, spoken about it extensively, but is this being applied elsewhere it, there... it really it really isn't and yeah, uh, you know we had that we had that one benefactor out here when we were doing that job in northern san diego county it was a, a smaller system and uh he, the benefactor got less he became less of a benefactor when he saw what the money he could oh, dear. <laughs> he could make on it i think umass dartmouth we just gave umass dartmouth uh permission and actually with uh, greener U permission to to use the model uh, there, if they, if they, and they, they, I think they have some benefactors there that they're pulling together for, for a solar system. There we were, you know, when we were working on that a couple of years ago, that we were looking at ten megawatts of solar uh, at that campus, a pretty big system. And if you know, just from a financial standpoint, if you find some benefactors that are willing to just get their money back, and they do that through um, through collecting tax credits and depreciation benefits. They just get past the tax recapture period. You know, they made their money back with a small return. If they're benefactors of the college or the university, then they or at the school, then they donate that at that point. And you don't you don't want to be careful. You don't want to try to get too much of a charitable contribution at the back end of the deal, right. uh, if any. 
but uh, it, it can work out. It can really be a win-win, we think. And I, I attribute Mark Hopkinson for all that. For all that, there are some nuances in that in the tax code there. You got to be very careful about. Yeah, it sounds like all of the stars aligned for this project in terms of the utility rate, this grant. Um, you know, the connections that you had at Millbrook School, the trust that was already built, and a really eager CFO or um, champion CFO who really saw the value in what you were offering and brought it into fruition. Um, so do you want to tell us a little bit more about the system itself? Yeah, and, I, and, and also <laughs> while we're mentioning the champion CFO, I, I, I jump in there and say we had a champion board member, Rick Stuckey. Right. Well, I think his son went to school with with you, and Rick was just uh, you know the head fund manager. I mean, just as sharp as a tack, and and he really really dove in. And so it it took those. I, I like what you said. The stars aligned. I mean, it, it took a lot of uh, alignment and certain key players that were able to push yeah. through and keep things. But yeah, in terms of the system, um, it's about eight, eight acres, and it's all fenced in. And and one of the the um, provisions that the environmental folks at the school wanted, Jane and John in particular, was they wanted that chain link fencing that's got, it, I, think it, I guess it's black in color. It's actually got a little bit of a plastic coating on it or something, but it, it makes it so it just, sort of, it, it doesn't, you, you don't see it. It's not as visible. Um, it's, um, we've got about a dozen rows that are long rows of, of, of solar panels. There's, I, I looked it up, there's 5,852 uh, 295 watt solar panels. They're Trina wow. panels, which is a, a Chinese made product. They're solar max inverters, which are uh, a German technology. So the system's about 1.7 kW, 1.7 megawatts. And it was designed to generate in that first year about 2.2 million kilowatt hours a year. And that's what we, that's what we determined that the school would use, uh, in a single year. So, um, Pretty cool. Um, just in terms of the system, uh, and you might have heard a little bit about this, but you know, one of the real complexities of solar systems is, is hooking them up uh, and what they call the interconnection. And so, you know, I like we like to say that every job has its challenges, um, and that that's an understatement. Um, but in this in this case, you know, we had we had looked all over the campus for a good location. Uh, and the campus is idyllic, as you know, in these brick buildings and these slate roofs that no way you're going to put solar on them. And a anywhere on the main campus, you know, there's a lot of resistance from the architects and the, I don't know, the aesthetic, the, the aesthetic you know, angle. There was nowhere to put a lot of solar. So we started looking at, at fields around the campus. And there's, uh, the campus is 800 acres. So there's, there's a lot of fields. And we checked out all, we trooped around all the fields. And of course, we ended up putting the solar system in the farthest one away, which uh, which was great in terms of getting it out of sight, other than a few landowners that are up on some ridge lines that are far away that that actually Headmaster Drew Cossertano checked in with to make sure that they were comfortable with us going there. But we ended up with this field that was far away. So that would be, that's great, right, from an aesthetic standpoint, but how do you bring the power to the school? In California, you have to tie in where the meters are, and the meters are at you know, the field house, the gym, there's a big meter and then there's another big meter closer to the, the dining hall over there. So, so we were thinking about running a cable, running the cable, the output of the solar system, you know, what, half a mile or three quarters of a mile. One way would have had to go through a swamp, a wetland protected in New York state. Very, very difficult. Another way would have been taking a much more circuitous route and then stringing our cables all along the, the power poles, all the way up school road back to the campus. So, that was a really big deal uh, and, and potentially a showstopper. Thankfully, the state of New York has a policy, had, I think it still has, a policy called remote net energy metering. And because there was a small meter out by out the observatory, for those that know Millbrook, uh, way out way out and back by the observatory, or over by the swamp and the, and the, and the, ski, the old ski hill, the little observatory using about nine kilowatt hours a year that they allowed us to interconnect at that point. So that was a, that was really a godsend. Yeah, that was um, major. Long we had, uh, <laughs> we had a, we had a power factor issue uh, where, uh, you know, we were in the, we were in the real fingers, I like to say in the fingers of the central Hudson distribution network. 
and all of a sudden you're adding uh, you know a major renewable uh, power source with no reactive power coming off it, only true power coming off of it. So we had a power factor issue. Fortunately, those solar max inverters that I mentioned can be adjusted, so we were able to make a power factor adjustment at the inverter level. So those were those were some of the tricky issues um, that came up there, but they were nicely overcome. Wow, I'd say so. And so what happens after it's all hooked up? How did the school how did the school know that the system is performing properly? Yeah. Well, we we, we kind of kept a look on and a look at it for for several years and and checked the bills and and made sure that the made sure that the savings that the credits were being, you know, appropriately uh credited to the school and to the to the bills there. So there was an issue and I think year number 2 with a couple of the inverters Solar City had had some solar uh, inverter faults. I think they had to replace a couple of the inverters out there. And I think they've, I, I trust that uh, the contract, as I said earlier, the power purchase agreement, which makes very clear the terms, uh, is, is good. And the school is all, all on top of it. As you know, there's an ABLE team there, Jeff Smith, who's now the CFO, and Ben Day, head of operations, that I'm sure are making sure that they're getting what they pay for. You know, the school only pays for metered kilowatt hours. Again, with a guaranteed with a guaranteed kilowatt hour performance. Can you explain uh, a little bit what that means for us, lay well, people? That, yeah, I mean, what what's <laughs> in the contract is is the expected output in terms of kilowatt hours for every year. I mentioned the first year, the system was generating two point two million kilowatt hours. So there's a little bit of degradation, half a percent per year, I think, built into the contract. But the the system has to deliver that to the school, and that's the deal. Uh, and if the system doesn't deliver that, then let's just say it's let's just say it's ten percent short for one reason or another, some inverters right. fail or whatever. Uh, it's ten percent short. Well, then Tesla, which is now the owner of the system, has to. And so at that point, if it's ten percent short, that means that the school had to go out and purchase that power from Central Hudson Gas and Electric for that twelve cents that we were talking about instead of the seven right. and a half cents. So Tesla actually has to pay for that shortfall and pay the difference wow. in price there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so the school is the school is made whole you know, through that kind of a power purchase agreement as long as you've got somebody like a financial officer which is in place at Millbrook and a maintenance person that's savvy that's kind of aware of what's going on with the system on board and they do. And you said these PPA contracts are good for about 20 years or what is the lifetime of the system? Well, this is a 20-year power purchase agreement. Um some of them are structured at 25. We've seen 30. Uh, so there's different there's different lengths, and then they always will have a provision for extending it for another five years, and they'll have rates or or they'll have also have buyout provisions. Um, but you asked how long a system should last. It's it's being properly maintained. I, I can attest to that. When I went out there, it looks beautiful, uh, and it's all remotely monitored, so they know if there's a problem. But uh, you know these systems, all the all the all the panels are guaranteed for twenty five years, but they're lasting thirty forty years. So I, I think I think we're in we're in good shape. But I guess Millbrook's about halfway through its contract, and they right. could probably they can probably renew that contract to extend it for at least another five years. Okay, so that's what you anticipate will happen at at the end of the twenty year contract, an extension. I, or? I would think so. I would yeah. think so. Yeah. Okay. Unless there's a better option, but I don't, I, I would imagine that that would be the best thing to do. Right. All right. And so what are the next steps for Millbrook? Yeah, well, this is very humbly presented because we, we have work for the school. We're not under contract and we've done lots of different aspects as I alluded to earlier, but, you know, unsolicited com comments. Um, if I were, if I were managing Millbrook's carbon footprint, I would certainly look at, again, as we did 10 years ago, I would look at the energy efficiency opportunities. There's been a lot of, a lot of construction on campus. There's a, there's a lot of beautiful facilities. Um, we saw lots of lights on that, that didn't need to be on. I don't, I'm not sure that there's adequate controls on, on some of these systems. So there's probably, as in every facility, <laughs> there's, there's probably quite a few things that can be done to control energy use better and to reduce it through, through energy efficiency. Right. Um, my, um, you know, the thing that I would do also uh, is I'd look at adding more solar. I mean, I think that the school has been a leader in terms of carbon neutrality and pushing towards carbon neutrality and 
you know, as it's grown, it, you know, added the dorms and added the dining hall and, you know, big facilities have been added. I'm sure that the school is using much more than the 2.2 million kilowatt hours that, that it did back in, in 2013. My, you know, my pet project there would be to use the roof of the field house, you know, where, or the gym or the ice rink, I guess the ice rink roof, which is a big tin building. It's not a, it's not an architecturally attractive facility at all. It is an industrial building. This is the mill, houses, the mill center. It's in, it's tied to the mills athletic center and it's just the, it's the ice rink, I guess. And it's just yeah. got a perfect roof for solar. Uh, you could lo load it up both on the, it's, it's a pitched roof. You load up the east side, the west side. I, I think you'd probably be able to get enough solar there to again, to again net out the entire school's entire school's load. Well, very exciting accomplishments, and always more more to come and more to do um, on this journey to carbon neutrality. Do you have any final thoughts on the Millbrook Solar story that you'd like to share, Dad? Uh, just a few, but it's it's. I think it's a colorful story, and there's so many colorful stories. And as we said before, they're all driven by these people. I think I mentioned uh, all the players at Millbrook, Jane and John Omegs. Without them, that wouldn't have happened. Drew Cossertano, the headmaster, Bob Connolly, who's who I, has just recently passed away. Mm -hmm. What a superb gentleman he was. He was the financial officer we talked about. Rick Stuckey, the board member, and then at the Eco Motion team, as always, Michael Ware our senior solar specialist extraordinaire who is supported in this job by uh, by brother Russell Flanagan. So it it takes a team effort. And uh, as you said, the stars were really aligned at Millbrook for this project. Mm. Well, thank you so much for sharing about this story. It's such a wonderful story and one that I hope adds value and, and inspiration to our listeners. Um, more to come so stay tuned i think for now this this wraps our clean energy crash course millbrook school the solar story um but you can you know listen to my dad's many podcasts that he's generating regularly and on spotify or itunes or wherever you find listen to your podcasts and for now it's been lovely speaking with you father um <laughs> More to I'm, come. More to come. I'm very inspired myself by all of your leadership and um, wow. and really living up to our family's legacy, I think. So yeah, that's great. Love you. Love and you thank too. you. And thanks to everybody who's tuning in today. Um, take care.